Good afternoon. I haven't been queued yet, but I assume we're okay. Hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. Um, my name is Daniel Brown. I'm the executive manager for Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison and a proud sponsor of today's event. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I, <clears throat> so I lived in Baraboo for, uh, for about 10 years, and I used to go to Devil's Lake and do a little shore fishing now and again, and I would see scuba divers, see their flags up there. I wouldn't see them, of course, they're underwater. But uh, as I'm driving along John Nolan, I'm looking out at the lake, I began to wonder, gosh, I wonder if they do scuba diving out there. I bet they do. Um, which led me to a fun little fact. I don't, how many scuba divers do we have in the room? We have one. So don't answer this question, please. <laughs> but when, when the scuba divers are on a boat and, and they fall backwards, why do they fall backwards? Because if they fell forward, they'd fall right back into the boat. <laughs> Forgive me, I am a dad. <clears throat> and that's not the first time I told that, uh, I guess we loosely call a joke. Um, that's uh, something I've used in the past. It's a standard, it's a bit of a fallback. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> I know I'm killing you, sorry. So Native people are, are sort of uh, romanticized for our being stewards of the land. Um, and, and that's true, obviously, there had to have been, you know, back before European settlement, there had to have been uh, a symbiotic relationship with fauna and flora. Um, and the spirituality of, of Native people was very important, so there had to be a, a, a time when there was, we, we thrived as people. Because that provided for that leisurely reflection, the spirituality that was practiced. And we sort of fast forward to uh, the formation of uh, the United States of America, the government, which eventually led to uh, federal policy that was not kind to natives. Um, Ho-Chunk Nation, for instance, in 1841, were removed from the area, and it got me thinking about this whole the natives are stewards of the land thing. Is it possible that we may have forgotten? We may have forgotten some of these things. You know, as a native person, I am not innately imbued with the ability to take care of the land, as it were. Um, so I got to thinking a little bit about this um, and about what we are doing here today, uh, what's being done by this organization on a consistent basis. And I'm, I'm, I feel good that you know, we're, this is a path, this is something that assists us as Ho-Chunk people and Native people in general and, and all people, but for Native people to be, be provided with a path back to our roots. And so our involvement in this organization um, is for us an opportunity um, to get back to our roots, to learn, um, and to practice, and to make people aware, um, and for people to care more and more about sustainability as a whole. Um, I think about our, you know, our casinos, and I think about the generation before me. Because by 1841, how many generations had been deculturalized? of my people. We were removed from our land for thousands of years, you know, we commune with Mother Earth, and now we're in uninhabitable places. And then you couple that with the assimilation that the federal government sort of imposed on, on Native people, and there would be a tendency, a natural a tendency to forget. And I think about the generation just ahead of me, my mother and that group of Ho-Chunk Nation legislators that sort of ushered in the era of gaming. Um, in 1988, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was enacted, and that was essentially allowed for the, the government to regulate gaming. But that opened the floodgates for gaming in, across, across this country. And, 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 I, and I think about when I got up here back in 1993, I came from a place called Indiana. A bit of a misnomer, I don't remember seeing very many Indians in Indiana. Um, but um, when I got here, I remember just the, you know, the, the state of our people and how gaming has uplifted our people, and the standard of living's been uplifted, and that there's now time for leisurely activity, there's time for leisurely reflection. And I've watched a renaissance in the last 30 years, a renaissance of our culture, a renaissance of our language, and a renaissance in terms of the concern for our, for our environment. I look at the table here, we have a whole chunk of people here, and I look at some of the young folks that are, are passionate about this thing, 
And so I'm very, um, and I have to admit fully that the whole sustainability piece, because I'm in this generation, I won't tell you how old I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not old, but I'm not young, and so the whole sustainability piece is a bit of an enigma to me, but I understand sort of intuitively its importance. And so today I stand before you just to tell you that I'm very proud, very proud to be a sponsor here today, and hope that you all have a fantastic time, a, a great day, and uh, thank you for your tolerance of my would-be jokes. Have a great day. Thank you. And before I go, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mr. Ed. Mr. Ed. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Uh, Ed Freer, uh, local urban designer, landscape architect. Uh, I'm not young, but I'm getting older. <laughs> and um, let me see if I can figure things out here. So uh, this is the first of two in, uh, of transformational projects, and this one is uh, called Lake Monona Waterfront. Those in the loop, LMW Master Plan. Uh, let me just see. So this is a, a very complicated, and I better set my time here because I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do this in 15 minutes, but I'll try. So how many of you heard about this project? Great. Um, so it's, it's uh, in my 50-year career, it's probably one of the most energetic and publicly supported projects in my career. The momentum is tremendous. The complexity is tremendous. The outcome is going to be fabulous. So the site, Lake Monona, on the right, which most of you know, we're always talking about our great lakes. Um, and the objective of this project is to transform and create accessibility and uh, connect it to the isthmus and the downtown, similar to the way that a lot of us think of the of Mendota, the Union, the various uh, James Madison Park, uh, Tenney, all those parks. So here's an opportunity to try and figure out how to get up above the bluff, how to connect to the neighborhoods, how to connect with the lake, even if you don't have a boat. So uh, the players are, it's a collaborative effort, and I want to give credit to the Ad Hoc Committee, which was formed over two years ago, and the Ad Hoc Committee members here. Uh, they're a fabulous group. They, they've done some heavy lifting. They were um, appointed, and they were given the charge to put this thing together from the RFQ process to the final submittal to City Council, which hopefully will be the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Uh, it was supposed to be a little earlier, but that's the way things happen. Uh, the actual consult, and then it's being run by uh, City Parks and Rec, uh, Mike Strum and C.J. Ryan and Eric Knepp. So the prime consultant on this project is not me. I'm just one of the sub-consultants, Ed Freer, and I work for Grafe, Sasaki and Associates, which is based in Boston but they're also, uh, the team is half Boston, half Denver, and the leadership for the team is coming out of the Denver office. But then there's myself, uh, Moffat Nickel, they specialize in coastal environments, waves, ice, things like that. And I wanna give a special thank you to Cloris Lowe, who represents the, uh, the uh, Ho-Chunk tribe, who's been a wonderful mentor, and he has constantly referenced materials and things that make us a little more sensitive and try and understand some of the things that uh, Dan was sharing with you. So uh, the actual project let's see if I can, is not the whole lake. It's this 1.7 miles. So it goes from Machinery Row or Law Park North along the face of Monona Terrace, Law Park South, then we get to the causeway and then Olin Park. So most of you that have, do most of you use the, the uh, lake shore down in front of the terrace and everything? You notice how narrow it is, how uh, inviting, but also how treacherously challenging, especially at commuter time when you've got three rows of bicycles, walkers, fishermen, whatever. And let's top it off with a ski show. It gets to be a pretty busy place. So that's the challenge of how do we connect all this. 
Then on top of that, we have uh, two wonderful projects that are in progress. Um, if I say the hairball intersection, everybody know where I am? Willie Street and Williamson? Well, that's neared completion, uh, but then Law Park went through a planning exercise. And then the other current project is uh, John Olin Drive, uh, the causeway from North Shore down to Olin Park. So there's an opportunity to influence the master plan, but also an opportunity for the master plan to influence these two huge infrastructure projects. So this has been going on, at least my involvement, for a couple of years. But before that, there was actually quite an extensive public engagement process that took place both with Law Park and the intersection project then also as part of the John Nolan reconstruction. So it was an extensive project that was um, urban assets and equity by design were heavily involved in both. So we benefited from all this knowledge and all, uh, in two ways. Once we received and were enlightened, but also it didn't make the competition portion of the project as cumbersome because it was more visionary and it was more streamlined. So after that, so there was a, an extensive RFQ process, 15 firms or teams uh, submitted, five were shortlisted, three were interviewed. Uh, our team, we were lucky enough and very appreciative to have been selected. After that, there was a 14-week 14, um, 14 phase where the three teams prepared a competition. On January 24th, they had the uh, presentation at the main library downtown. Firm was selected. We then had from January until basically now to refine the master plan. And so what I'm gonna share is not necessarily the final plan, there's background. Some things that have been talked about are, I'm, I'm sharing now, there's cer certain things that are in evolution and they're just not uh, ready to be publicly presented because they may not happen. So I don't want to misguide or misrepresent where things are and I don't want to uh, have your expectations be wrong either. So. Uh, so in theory, if everything goes well, we're working feverishly with the ad hoc committee, and I believe there's going to be a submittal at the end of the year or the beginning of the year. That then will end the master planning process, and part of that will also show uh, prioritization and perhaps identify one or two projects that would move ahead. And again, uh, everybody needs to understand that this is a, a very complicated project, a lot of uh, environmental issues, a lot of community opportunities, and it takes time. So this is not gonna be built in five years. Will it be realized in a couple of decades? It is absolutely possible. It depends a lot on the funding opportunity and the will to move forward. So again, this project has been preceded with a phenomenal history within the community. And I don't mean to be lecturing, or a lot of you are probably familiar with these, but it goes all the way back to the pre-European settlement and there is I believe 44 uh, Ho-Chunk villages or, or sites of occupation of some form from living to uh, being spiritual sites. We have one of the highest concentrations in the country of the folks that were here before the pre-white settlement came. But then there were a number of uh, urban forms and plans that were done in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Everyone knows about the Nolan plan. The irony is that in, in January 26th, when the competition was presented, 100 years earlier, the John Nolan plan was presented. At the Isthmus, there were uh, 350 people present. 100 years later, we presented the competition, the three firms presented. We had about uh, three to 400 people at the library. Not everybody could fit in the, in the room. They were out in the, in the forecourt and there were 2,500 people online. So it's amazing the level of participation and engagement that this community has, and that's what's gonna help make this project go forward. Subsequent to that, there were the 1830s, the 40s, and then um, back up to where we are today. So in terms of the project, the guiding principles uh, were important, creating a living edge, inspired generational stewardship, paying forward, as we say on the team, a place that cannot and can be connected, enhance equitable access to the parks, to the neighborhoods, starting with voices 
in a balanced perspective. So you're going to see a lot of individual efforts and, and slices, but the ultimate solution will be a balanced contextual solution. So um, when we got together at the beginning of the process, uh, after three days, 13 minute uh, meetings, a lot of videos, a lot of interviews, we were sitting at Sardines having a late dinner. It was one of the few places you could actually get dinner at eight o'clock uh, during the COVID period. And we sat there and we were talking and I, I made the comment saying, I worked in this building for 12 years and every day she had a different personality, she being Lake Monona. And then we started reflecting on all we were hearing and everything and all of a sudden the term came out all by itself, the voices of the lake. And that's what we based this whole effort on. And the voices of the lake were instructing and guiding us on inclusivity, connectivity, water quality, shoreline enhancement, resiliency, and uh, transportation. So we went through a series of uh, efforts to reach out. Uh, inclusivity, all of the flyers, posters, inquiries were trilingual. Uh, Ho Chunk Mung and uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Quat and English. And so um, we reached out, we, grocery stores, supermarkets, neighborhood flyers. Uh, we had a number of this 14 week period. Every two weeks we had a uh, session with the ad hoc committee and there were two stakeholder groups that would present, constantly informing us, the bicycle community, the Ho-Chunk community, the environmental community, the water community, uh, Clear, Clean Lakes Alliance, things like that, the Nolan, uh, Friends of the Nolan Group. So we went through this constant accumulation of information. Then we learned about um, what was going on at City Hall, the traffic energy and projects. And then also we learned a lot about the programming and how the connectivity to the neighborhoods was heavily uh, influenced by the programming and what people wanted to do. Uh, this continued, where am I here, yeah. Uh, I think the important thing of this slide here is the one on the right. Uh, there's um, the 1.7 miles of the lakefront, and you can start seeing some of the implied improvements. But what's really important is this map down here. I was lucky enough to live and start college and work in Boston, and everybody talks about Boston's emerald necklace. Well, when you start looking at this lake, at uh, this the two lakes, the isthmus, and all this green. These green are actually dedicated public open spaces and major public corridors. And you can see how well connected we are in the system of green that brings us down to our project. And so we think it's insurmountable, but obviously it shouldn't be. So uh, sustainability and what I think some of the folks in this room are interested in is the water quality and the shoreline enhancement. <clears throat> so we started learning a lot, and if this is old hat, I apologize, but there are some really unique currents that occur in Lake Monona. So when you go down there, you say, well, why are all the fishing boats over here? I wonder why. It's where all the diners are. The fish just line up. It's, it's the food channel. <laughs> and then why are the fish here in addition to the currents and the activity? Because of all of these submerged vegetative areas. That's so now I've got a diner to feed the family and I've got nurseries everywhere to keep propagating all the different rich species that are in this lake. So to start thinking about a wonderful park and walking and bicycling and boating and swimming, we had to start understanding why the personality of the lake? Where does that voice come from? And so we started getting into some of this technical research. Now I wanna make sure, I, I wanna say this positively, because this is a very positive project. Uh, I wanna make sure your expectations are within the understanding that we are not gonna solve the challenge of the county. We're surrounded by agriculture and non-point pollution. So, Ed, you put a boat dock in there, and you know what? The water quality isn't any better. Well, it's not because of the boat dock. We are surrounded by an agricultural community, drainage patterns that come to this area. Uh, up at the Capitol, we've got about 62 acres of stormwater collected and put into the lakes. We can, again, the master plan can influence how we 
um, deal with that stormwater in our catch basin designs, our filters and things like that. We can reduce the impact, but we're not gonna change the six to eight outfalls that are in Lake Monona. But whatever we build down there, we can influence by what we, just, and I'll show you some suggestions, the paving, the, the wetlands, the, the filters. We cannot add to the quantity. We're not gonna solve the, the larger regional problem. I just wanna make sure everybody understands that from an expectation. You know, here, here we are and we're just surrounded by all these elements that, that contribute. And here are, are this, uh, distillation of the diagrams I just showed you. And then I'll get into more of the detail of some of the suggestions of how we can improve the lake. And here they are. So a linear site is a challenge, but, and we have existing outfalls that we can't eliminate, but we can help encourage the treatment of that. But along this skinny little place here, and then we have these wonderful park areas that we can influence what happens on the land. So here the, the park is literally the width of the shoreline to John Nolan, the causeway. Uh, we have this limited piece of real estate in front of Monona Terrace, the building we're in. But we have some opportunities here and we have some major opportunities here. But then you see all these little green dashes. Here is a menu that we're starting to create where we're putting in floating wetlands or uh, bioswales and we're, we're putting fish habitat underneath uh, piers and everything. Here's some more of the engineering types of structures that we can incorporate that create filters and treatment before it goes. So these can all be incorporated in the design and the programming that, that is the end suggestion. So a major improvement towards the sustainability of our lake and of our county, and hopefully why you're here. This is starting to identify how you put all these pieces together. So this is an illustration, it's not a final design, but you can see the relationship of John Nolan and the trains. You can see the shoreline, the introduction of a boardwalk with artistic uh, incorporations that can both uh, incorporate public art that tells the story of the lakes, the ecology. It can tell the story of the Ho-Chunk, those that were before us. It, so it becomes a story walk. It becomes an interpretive element. It incorporates vegetation, wetlands, stormwater filtration, fish hotels underneath the boardwalk, a slow walk, a fast walk, a bicycle trail, sun, shade, and then access all along there. So this is what we're striving for. In terms of transportation, limited real estate. This is the causeway, John Nolan. But we, working with city engineering, we're able to push this to, the, to Monona Bay and create a little more real estate here. It's not huge, but it gives us more room to create greenery between a pedestrian bike circulation, uh, reduce the lanes in the, in the uh, causeway, and it also allows us to put some structures out here that start creating alternative ways to navigate the perimeter. Uh, down in John and uh, Olin Park, there's a separation of the fast bicycles and the slow bicycles, the change of materials from paved to non-paved. Up on the other end, up by uh, Law Park North, uh, being able to separate the faster bicycle traffic and the slower uh, bicycle and walking traffic along the lake. Uh, the connections to the upland and to the terrace. The connections to Wilson Street uh, above future expansion of Monona Terrace and uh, additional ex expansion to the east. Uh, the connection to this intersection. So there's multiple connections uh, to the upland. Most importantly, which I didn't mention, are the improvements to the intersections of North Shore and um, Broom, yeah, Broom Street. So we had an unfortunate incident during the process where a, an older gentleman was hit on his bicycle. So those two intersections are going to be a major improvement. For those of you that saw the initial plan, um, we did have a couple of pedestrian bridges proposed. They had been removed because of comments and, and the current sediment in the discussion. Uh, what has come up as a replacement is a uh, below grade or an underground uh, tunnel that accommodates pedestrians and bicycles that will hopefully be incorporated in the John Nolan redesign. And about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think city council approved uh, an additional million dollars to help 
defer some of those costs. So all that is happening, and the master plan hasn't even been submitted. So Voices of the Lake, Four Seasons, it's not a summer gig. Again, how do you manage all this in the wintertime? And you have one, two, three different forms of circulation. This kind of shows you the, the nature of the opportunities. Everybody right now says, where do I walk? There's no place. Well, here's three, three places of conveyance. Do I maintain this in the wintertime and not this in the summer? Or, I mean, uh, yes and no in the winter. Those are all things that have to be discussed and figured out. But it's definitely a four season, 24 seven kind of a place. There are two or three uh, major nodes. Uh, this is an expansion of Monona Terrace. This is a, a connection through the building that is being uh, under construction right now. A large amphitheater, uh, a playground, cafe, another vertical elevator. So now we have an elevator in Monona Terrace, but we'll also have an elevator here. The rerouting or the separation of bicycle travel here and around to reduce the uh, faster pedestrian traffic so that people can walk and enjoy. There's a couple opportunities to swim in the lake, boating piers, um, a perched beach, so it's a beach that's above the water level. So there's certain types of traditional waterfront that don't necessarily engage the water. So that's one way of mitigating, um, promoting activity and not always having to worry about the water quality. I mean, how many times do our beaches get closed every summer? So some of these elements try and anticipate that. And then an Olin Park in the south, uh, this is gonna be more natural. Again, a variety of paved and unpaved uh, paths. The concept of a tree walk, completely ADA accessible. So you can feel what it's like to be up there in the canopies, uh, the potential for some type of a community building interpretive element uh, or interpretive educational element. Uh, those of you who frequent Olin Park, it's a phenomenal view of the Capitol. And I think I'm getting the thumbs up to hurry up. This, is the, this should be the last thing. So anyway, the last three images that I showed you uh, hopefully will help you visualize how all these little techie hot spots and how do, you you know, how do you solve the water quality? How do you solve the underpass, the overpass? When it all comes together, these are the, the visuals and the aesthetic that results. This becomes another part of Madison's waterfronts, one of the waterfronts that we can all be proud of, but more importantly, enjoy. And that is it. Just briefly in between the presentations, I'd like to mention that there are note cards on all of your tables. And if you have any questions about either of these projects, fill those out and a sustained Dane staffer will come around and pick them up for the Q&A that will happen after John's presentation. All right, take it away, John. All right, thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is John Welch. I am the director of the Dane County Department of Waste and Renewables. I'm uh, excited to talk to you about the things we do now, but more importantly, our plans for waste management, resource management in the community for the future, and how you can all help us shape that. Uh, so just briefly, this is our site. We are uh, on the east side, uh, just east of the interstate, as you're heading towards um, kind of AB area, County Road N, and, and continuing that way, Cottage Grove area. Uh, this is our landfill here. We also have a lot of things on our site beyond the landfill. Uh, but I'll start with that. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you rolled your garbage cans out to the curb in the last two weeks? All right. Um, so my point of that is this is a really critical service to our community, right? If the waste is not being collected, it's not being managed properly, there's much worse options. You just have to Google really quickly and you can see pictures of this happening in other parts of the world. Waste being dumped directly into the ocean, waste just piling up on the side of the road, right? So it is a critical service that we provide to the community and it starts with the, with the landfill, but there's so much more that we're trying to do in the future. Uh, we also have a lot of recycling programs on our, on our site actually. We do a wood yard, tire recycling, shingles, uh, bikes. We have household hazardous waste for all the nasty things that shouldn't go in the landfill paints, chemicals, fertilizers, electronics, et cetera. Um, we also have a large construction and demolition recycling facility, and this is 
uh, kind of a, uh, an example of what we can do in the future. It's a great public-private partnership where construction and demolition materials used to all go in the landfill. We now recycle about 70 to 80,000 tons of material through that building. It's a facility that the county built and we own, and we have a public-private partnership with a private organization that operates that facility. So that's a great example. Um, we also have our renewable natural gas facility. So that's uh, a facility that takes landfill gas. As garbage breaks down, it forms gas. It's a very harmful green, uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, we're actually collecting that. And instead of just destructing it as the, the air permits require us to, we're actually converting that into energy. We used to convert it into electricity, renewable electricity. We now actually convert it into vehicle fuel. So we're cleaning up landfill gas to pipeline quality standards, injecting it into the pipeline. We're using a portion of that in our own fleet. We're compressing it. We have CNG fueling stations at our fleet buildings. And the remainder we actually sell to Quick Trip, who sells it to fleets throughout the upper Midwest. So those are some of the things we're doing now. Um, these are some of our upcoming projects, but I really want to kind of focus here. 2029, our landfill will be full. So what do we do next? It's not okay to just close the door and say, our community is going to ship our waste somewhere else. We're going to truck it a mile and a, an hour and a half down the road and put that burden on some other community. We need to start planning for the landfill, the future landfill, and that's kind of the focus of or the start of this project. But if I were just here to talk about a landfill, I actually don't think I would be here, right? I don't think you guys would have me on this stage to talk about a landfill. Um, as we look at a landfill and other facilities for the future, it sets the stage for what are we going to do as a community with our waste. Um, this facility could serve us for decades into the future. And in 10, 20, 30 years from now, we don't want to be doing the same things with our waste. This is a great opportunity for us to design and, and plan facilities to help that transition, that shift away from everything gets thrown away to looking at these materials as wasted resources. How can we bring those back into the circular economy? How can we drive that change? I'll talk a little bit in the next several slides about some of our ideas and how we can help tip that needle a little bit, but obviously we can't do it ourselves. As a county waste organization, we can't uh, always impact how uh, product developers or manufacturers create their products and whether it can fit it within a circular economy. That's part of the larger discussion from all of us and, and society as a whole. So as I said, uh, we are working towards these future plans. We've identified a site across the road from our current facility. We've purchased the eastern half of the Yahara Hills Golf Course, a little over 200 acres. Uh, we are in the planning and design phases for that. A landfill in general takes five to 10 years to plan, so we're already in that planning phase, but that's kind of our time frame too to build out the sustainability campus and all these other things we want to do at the site. Again, we don't want to have just a landfill. We want to help create areas where we can encourage businesses to come in or we can create uh, programs ourselves to divert more and more waste materials from the waste stream and from the landfill. This is kind of a very early conceptual idea where you can have people coming in, dropping off in numerous areas, then that's feeding into the businesses on the front end of, of the campus. On the left side here, we could have, uh, I'll talk about some of the ideas we have for various recycling businesses. As we look at that though, it's important to look at what does our waste stream look like? We don't want to spend $100 million on recycling something that's 2 or 3% of our waste stream, right? So looking at where are we going to have the biggest impact first, and then we can continue on that progression as we, as we move forward. So with that, one of our biggest areas we look at immediately is, is organics. So organics and food waste, um, if you're here, you know that this is incredibly important. It's in also incredibly, uh, a, a, an incredible contributor towards greenhouse gases within uh, the world. Over a, approximately a third of all food that's grown is thrown away and wasted, leads to greenhouse gases, uh, methane emissions, et cetera. Um, so we're working on this project, this uh, problem already and taking incremental steps. Uh, we have, let's see if I can move on. We've issued an RFP already. We're currently in the interview stage for bringing consultants in to help us to have a food waste composting facility and no later than the spring of 2026 here in Dane County, that'll take or all organic waste, yard waste, and food waste. So that will happen by the spring of 2026 at the latest. 
In uh, addition to that, we're also on a smaller scale, we've been giving out grants. You can see here we've given out grants to or small organizations. If there's people in this uh, room that have an idea or an opportunity, you need a little bit of seed funding to help with more food waste collection. So we've been working very well with Sustained Dane. You guys have probably seen food waste drop off at the farmer's markets as examples. Worked with a number of community gardens, et cetera. So trying to help uh, that initial stages of people thinking about collecting food waste. So when we have a facility in a couple of years, we'll have already started to build that infrastructure into place. But it goes much further than food waste. That's, that's an initial stage. So here are some ideas of what it could include. Um, and I'll just take a step back. We're, we already hired a consultant. They're working on our master plan for what does this all look like? What types of materials could we divert at the sustainability campus? What types of businesses could we bring in? We have to do things that are environmentally responsible, but they also have to make financial sense. Um, I forgot to mention this, but we are a government agency, but we don't operate like most government agencies. We don't use any tax dollars, and we never have. So our customers pay us to take their materials and manage those properly, and we want to have that same model for this. How can we bring in businesses continue to divert uh, waste, recycle materials, and have it at least pay for itself. We want to set that, that standard and be an example for other communities to follow. So that consultant is looking at various materials such as mattresses, um, renewable energy. Can we have a retail, rest, uh, like a resale retail place? Uh, lots of education, uh, food waste, uh, plastics, all sorts of materials. What can be included in this campus and can we make it make sense for our community? Uh, I'll put that call out to you all, but just start thinking right now, what waste do you know that you have? What things are you interacting with? What things have you seen and just thought, why isn't Dane County doing this? We want to hear from you. We want to help you to help us uh, creating that plan. So we're right now in that master planning stage. We are just starting to roll out some of our community engagement, and we want to hear from all you to help us to make this a better plan. This is kind of our timeline. Um, right now, there's still 36 holes of golf at the golf course. Uh, the city, completely separate from our process before we ever went down this path, had a golf course task force, say that five times fast. Um, and they, one of their biggest suggestions was this golf course should go from 36 holes down to 18. And so there's a plan to kind of transition towards that as our campus starts to ramp up. You can see here we're in the middle of our campus planning. And everything that you can see on the screen in yellow is an opportunity to engage with the community and with all of you. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those next steps with engagement. And again, we're already started the composting permitting uh, process. We're in the middle of trying to select a consultant to help us with that. Uh, specific to the campus, these are kind of some of our major milestones and opportunities for engagement with the public. Uh, we're just starting this process now. We just had a workshop uh, with our internal staff this week to get their input. Um, and next we'll be starting to roll out to community groups, interested parties, and general public engagement. So again, looking for all of you to help us uh, feed into this plan. This is a busy slide, but um, each of these main columns, starting at the top in between the arrows, is a major milestone in that campus planning process. And then there's a short description of what each of those is. And then down below in this, uh, the lower area, it shows the types of engagement that we're planning already. We have a, a pretty robust engagement plan that we've developed with the various types of engagement. Some of these are one-on-one -on -one interviews with very specific individuals. Some of them are larger in invites for the general public. Some of them are kind of in between there with interested parties, environmental groups, uh, folks invited, uh, involved in renewable energy, research. Um, some of our close neighbors and partners, Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison is right across the road. They've been a great partner to work with uh, and in terms of how our campus can fit in with their future plans as well. So a lot of opportunities for engagement. Again, think through how your organizations, the things you do day to day can help us uh, to attract more businesses, divert more waste at this campus. We'd love to hear from you. We have a booth out there, um, but also just we have a website for this project. Reach out to any of us at any time. We'd, we'd love to talk with you. Um, I know this is very fast, trying to do it in 15 minutes or less. Um, so again, our plan is 
to manage our waste materials differently in the future. This future campus could serve us for 50 plus years, could serve our community. We don't want to be taking all the same waste, putting it in a hole in the ground. So how can we economically and environmentally manage these materials in a different way, transition how we, we manage these resources uh, to better serve our community for 50 plus years in the future? Thank you. Thank you to our speakers, and we're going to transition to the Q&A. If people could hold up their questions, and sustained Dane staffers will come around and collect them. Uh, OK, I see some. Great. And we'll get them over to Mark. Already got one. Nice. Oh, thank you. That was quick. We're just working on some technical difficulties. Don't, don't mind us. Thank you. All right. Yep. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, how about this summit so far, right? Let's hear it for Claire and her team. We may have planned this wrong. I feel like every two seconds we're going to get, a, get, a, get something handed to me. So, so here are some questions from the audience. I also have a couple questions. I was scribbling notes while you guys were talking. So first of all, thank you both for your presentations and for the projects. They both sound phenomenal, and uh, I wish they could be done tomorrow. What is going to happen to the old landfill? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the short version is it's going to become a conservancy, a community resource, a, a place of recreation. So we want it to go from this place nobody wants to go to having to be an asset for the community. Uh, we capped about 32 acres of that landfill in the last five years, and we actually did a pollinator-friendly, butterfly-friendly prairie grass. Um, and so we see the entire site likely capped with that, with walking trails, potentially boardwalks through the wetlands to the north. Uh, we're already starting to begin that, that planning process on what does the community want to see there in terms of recreation uh, and having that be a space for that. We see the potential at the new site as well. We've got you know 200 plus acres at the new site, and we're not going to use all 200 acres at one time. So again, trying to get that feedback and make it an asset to the community. Cool. Uh, a popular question, doubled up, whoever this was, uh, what are you going to do with the old landfill? Same, same answer? All right, just, just, just we're testing it. We've got to keep them honest. Um, will the lakefront redesign allow for boats to pass under John Nolan? Uh, good question. Uh, one of the constraints on the project is not just the John Nolan Causeway, it's the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. So uh, railroads have... Uh, very stringent design guidelines in terms of the grade. Uh, I think it's under 2%. So the, the railroad bridge cannot be raised, therefore where the rail meets the road cannot change. So that then determines the, the clearance underneath the new John Nolan uh, reconstruction. So what you see today is pretty much what's going to be in the future. But that doesn't mean that the kayaks, the canoers, the, the crew rowers, and certain power bolts can't go through it. But it is close quarters. Good question. Um, how do we contact you all in the near future? Uh, email, newsletter, uh, names and contact info, I imagine we'll, we'll put that on the screen or we'll maybe send an email to all participants. Yeah? OK, thumbs up. I just made work for somebody. <laughs> Apologies, Sam. Um, good qu here's a question. Are you on salary? Yeah, yeah I, am, I am not. I'm, I'm creating work for the team. Uh, that's why I thank them to start. Uh, can pet waste be uh, com can can pet waste be compo uh, composted in the new sustainability campus? Um, we're we're still looking at that. Uh, likely will not be included initially. Um, Madison, as many of you know, did a pilot organics collection uh, several years ago and did a second version of that as well. And some of the things we've learned through that process is you know start. Uh, with the easier stuff and then work your way up. Uh, if you start with too much stuff, it actually uh, creates a mindset where you can put anything in there and it leads to too much contamination. So we're going to try to start with uh, primarily food waste and then work our way up from there. Okay. All right. Good question. Um, this one's for Ed. Is there a plan in place to, to offset um, emissions from the construction needed for the, for the project? 
we uh, have not discussed, discussed that part. So I don't have a, a clear baked answer for you, but it is noted, it has been talked about, and I'll make sure that the ad hoc committee and the rest of the design team hear your question. Good question. Um, what are your plans for reducing single-use plastic waste? Uh, what portion of the landfill is, is that today? So today, what portion of the landfill is single-use plastic, and what's the plan for the new? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, we call it the uh, transitioning ton, because we look at everything in terms of tons of waste, and it's not the same material it was 50 years ago. We have fewer newspapers, more Amazon cardboard boxes, and a whole lot more single-use plastics. So you used to get tuna in a can, and now it comes in a seven-layer plastic container, right? Um, we can't control what consumers are buying. Oftentimes, we're dealing with things on the back of the pipe. So we are looking at how can we manage those plastics, because it is a, a huge and growing portion of our waste stream. So one of the things we're looking at with our consultants is how can we manage those hard-to-recycle, single-use plastics, or how can we convert them in some other way. We're looking at technologies such as pyrolysis, for example, to see if that's economically and environmentally feasible. Um, there's so much waste from clothing, old shoes, and textiles uh, that are thrown out. Do you have plans for textile recycling? Yeah, so that is one of the uh, categories of waste that we are, um, we are looking at with our consultants. And I'm glad that question was asked because it wasn't really high on our list, and then just through our internal uh, staff engagement this week, we heard that again and again from folks. So it's kind of risen up the list. Okay. Um, sorry, Ed. There's not more questions for you. I'll, I'll make some up if I don't get a couple in the next in the next wave. Um, is a closed landfill safe? Short answer is yes. So there are stringent requirements in terms of how a landfill is closed and then how it is maintained mm -hmm. after. Uh, we actually have to have funds set aside for 40 years of maintenance of the landfill, um, but we are required to maintain it perpetually. So as an example, there's a closed landfill in Verona that we maintain. It closed in 1985, and we are still maintaining that facility today. So yes. Okay. Uh, here's one about the lakefront. Uh, is there or how is the city slash county planning to connect the lakefront to low-income areas around Madison to increase connectivity? Uh, again, as I was trying to share earlier, it wasn't a lot of time, but all of those major intersections are important connections to all the neighborhoods that immediately. You've got the Triangle being uh, redeveloped right now. The Triangle neighborhood, you have Lakeside, you have uh, Near East Side, you've got uh, including Monona, City Monona. So all of the accurate crossings uh, increase in the bicycle and recreational trail. Uh, some blue trail connectivity. Um, we have people coming all the way from Milwaukee to Fish Lake, Monona. So I can't guarantee you what that connection is. But the connectivity is there. The, the big charge or the order is to make them safer, make them more intuitive. Okay. And all the new development on Wilson Street, wherever possible, we want to connect that, uh, that upland to the top of the proposed park. Um, what kind of options are there for recycling mattresses? Uh, really the only option right now is to take it to a, a facility in La Crosse that does mattress recycling. Uh, but that is probably number one or two on our list after organics. Uh, we've done some counting with the city of Madison, with their waste stream and with our waste stream coming across the scale outside of theirs. And um, we estimate that we take in about 24,000 mattresses a year, and that doesn't include the student move out week. Um, so I'm sure it's- Well, there's much, another 24,000. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of mattresses. We see a lot of opportunity. Mattresses are over 90% recyclable materials, so it's just about creating that space and the business structure to make it make sense. Generally speaking, recyclers wanna come here and start a business at some of those capital costs. So perhaps the county can subsidize or we can create a building space where they can they can do that. So as part of the later stages of the master plan, we're actually going to put out RFIs asking businesses, what do you need in order to start your business here at the sustainability campus and see if we can support that. Well, this might be a 
good dovetail question uh, about the campus. Have you been partnering with any businesses or organizations to change how goods are, are produced in the first place? All part of the sort of the loop. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're actively involved in state and national associations and organizations doing that. Um, but obviously it's going to take more than Dane County Waste and Renewables to change how manufacturers uh, design and, and manufacture their product. Um, this one's for Ed. How can a young person uh, get involved with uh, the planning uh, process for this, this project? Well, young or old, uh, Mike Sturm of the City Parks is kind of the project manager. Uh, contact your alder, so parks directly the alder. Send uh, an email or a letter to the mayor's office. She's uh, helped organize and appointed the ad hoc committee. So I'd say they're your three most important contacts. Contact myself, Ed Freer, I'm at Grave. Um, Alan Arnston is out here, he's the chair. There's a table in the other room. So uh, please do contact any of us directly. And one short story here. Uh, first of all, does the room in general approve the direction the lakefront plan's going? So, so a story I, I need to have you hear is earlier in my career, I worked on a fantastic project. I'm a lucky man. Um, came time for approval, testimony in the, in the old days. A lot of testimony was given. Very few people gave testimony in support of the, of the project, which everyone loved. Everybody opposed gave testimony. So the body that was making the final decision, they thank God they tabled it. But nobody that was in support of a project they loved spoke up. So what I'm asking you is if you really believe in this project, do get engaged. Let your voices be heard. This is 100 years from now, just like we're celebrating the Nolan plan, I hope we're celebrating this lakefront plan. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, what's your Next question, what's your favorite part of the design? I think the fact that it's all trying to integrate all those voices, all those technical issues, all the, you know, the respect for the land in the past. Uh, it's such an incredible demonstration project from an educational standpoint. So all the things we're trying to solve today become more intuitive, more uh, of a natural pattern in how we think about things. So that's, I think, the, the, the outcome and the, the subtotal of all the parts is greater than any one of the individual parts. So I think the whole idea is fantastic and uh, let's build it for the future and so we have a better environment. That's great. Um, a couple of questions about um, the diversity and the inclusion around this project and at the end of the project as it results. Um, can you talk about the, the engagement process sure. um, and where, where it's been and where it continues to be uh, going forward? So at, at, you know, this particular project was uh, described as a competition. And to help uh, create this, um, create and define the boundaries of the competition, there were the two extensive engagement processes that I referred to earlier that uh, Urban Assets and uh, Equity by Design did. Those were major efforts and a lot of heavy lifting. During the process, I talked about the major organized stakeholder groups uh, speaking up and having s sessions that they could educate and inform the design teams, all three teams. Um, since then, uh, another Madison record. After the competition, there was a survey that the city had issued and it set a new record, over 2,000 respondents. That had never happened in Madison. In addition to that, we got over 8,000 comments that were submitted. So there's still going to be um, public meetings when, when the commission gets it, council gets it, and, and uh, scrutinizes it and has the obligation of approving it. But after that, each project, that, and this goes back to the emissions question, uh, once the specific projects are identified, there will be additional public scrutiny, public meetings, so it's not over until it gets built out. So from now until it's, it's done, there will be a constant interaction. So as these projects come online, there will be additional public engagement. Okay. So we should stay tuned and we should stay, stay ready. Absolutely. To, to, to give voice 
at it's, every turn. It's your lake. You own it. You help raise it. Great. Thank you. Um, how would a pickup composting service be priced for citizens? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a that's something that we're not sure yet. Um, and we and to be clear, we run a landfill right now and recycling organization or our recycling businesses. We don't do collection, and so we have been talking with the haulers about that. There are uh, a number of larger haulers that have already started this, or started to plan this pricing. Their customers are asking for it, their restaurants and commercial accounts are starting to ask for this. So they already know, once we have a site available for them to bring it, they know what their pricing structure looks like for that. Uh, for the smaller residential, there's a few services that are already, already out there. Feel free to reach out to us, we can put you in contact with a few of those. Uh, my guess is that those will continue to build as they have a place to take material, larger quantities of material. Um, and then just in general, as we develop this, our plan is for the tipping fee at our site to be uh, at or more likely below what our landfill tipping fee is to help encourage that as well. So um, what does the landfill currently do with batteries? Are there other plans for battery recycling uh, on, the, on the new campus? Yeah, so we, we take larger uh, vehicle car batteries, um, but not smaller batteries right now. Uh, this is a huge problem in the industry in general, not just here in Dane County, especially with the pro proliferation of lithium ion batteries, the rechargeable batteries, e-bikes and vaping and all the, the new uh, devices that are using these lithium ion batteries. Um, I think we're going to have to see some sort of a nationwide take back program. Uh, within the industry, we're starting to push for that. Uh, it's also a, a big driver of that is safety. These lithium ion batteries are causing numerous fires at waste facilities, at landfills, at recycling facilities. There's been two major recycling facilities in Wisconsin that burned down this year alone. Um, so it's a huge, huge safety issue. And I think we, we're, we're involved, we're engaged with a lot of organizations that are starting to work on this. Um, the DNR is applying for a large uh, national grant. We were going to apply for it and we heard they were, so we're gonna partner with them a bit on that and try to help uh, drive that change. Yep. Uh, not unlike uh, the engagement question on the waterfront project, um, how will the waste campus, the, the sustainability campus, include diverse voices uh, and serve black and brown communities? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, within our engagement plan that you saw that very busy slide, there's specific uh, groups and organizations that we are reaching out to. We want to make sure if you're interested to reach out to us as well. We have a website. We have an ability to get onto our mailing list, our, our newsletter. Um, but one other thing I'll point out too, uh, there's a long, terrible history of waste facilities being cited in black and brown communities and in communities uh, uh, with lower economic status. And it's, it's a really terrible history within our industry. Uh, one thing I will point out with this facility is that is not the case. You look at the communities surrounding us, um, definitely uh, uh, does not fit that demographic. Um, and some people would say that we have had more pushback from the neighbors because of that. Um, and and I, I still say that that's okay. Um, when we have elected officials come to me and say, hey, I've had a bunch of people from this neighborhood come to me and they're threatening with lawyers and they're mad about your plan. And um, quite often it's because they, don't, they aren't mad at the plan, they're mad that it's close to them. And I always tell our elected officials, this is the right place for this to be and here's all the reasons why. We could move it into another neighborhood or we could move it five miles down the road, but this is the best place for it to be. And no matter where we move it, it will impact some neighbors. So it needs to be in the right, the right community for, for the plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the next couple of questions are really all about food waste. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily, I mean, we'll start with you, John, but maybe it's, maybe sustained Dane folks can, can pitch in. How can we start or expand educating folks on food waste now, emphasis on, on now. Yeah, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, it, it really is just all the normal things with education, getting the word out there, creating programs, letting people see it uh, in the forefront. Uh, we were talking during our interviews this week with consultants, as an example, there's one of the, one of the respondents that has the ability to bag compost in small batches. So we talked about, as an example, could we uh, take the manure from the zoo 
keep that in separate piles, bag that in small batches and sell it back to the community. And, and people have a connection to it, but also then you can have that product at the zoo where hundreds of thousands of people come through and see it and can start to think about organics recycling, food waste recycling. So that's just one example, but it's, it's gonna take a number of individuals and organizations, the city, Dane County, Sustained Dane, and others to, to help get the word out. Okay. Um, I'm just getting some direction notes here. Um, versus the big sign, like get off the stage. Is that what, the, is that what that's supposed to say? Thank you. Um, well, here's, here's a question. Uh, why didn't the county start planning the landfill replacement um, earlier, decades ago? Had the city not uh, bailed you out, you would be up the proverbial creek. Yeah, I think, I think um, we started at the right time. Um, we started looking at this about three or so years ago, so that we were about 11 years out from when the landfill was going to be full. Typically, a landfill permitting is anywhere from five to 10 years. Um, so I think we were within the right time frame. Um, we looked at a number of sites, and there's a, without getting into all the specific, there's a lot of constraints in terms of actual regulations from the DNR, from the FAA in distance to airports, um, just the site in terms of proximity to uh, drinking wells and, and a whole lot of things, right? But then for us, specifically to the campus, it needed to fit our needs with proximity to the interstate, uh, having utilities, sewer, water, internet, so that you could support businesses on that site. Um, so there's a lot of factors that went into selecting that site. And again, I think we, we started at the right time. We should be able to have this permit done if, you know, if things go as we plan within the next probably two to three years at the latest, and we'd be looking to start construction in about six years or so. Okay, uh, this question is for both of you, and I'll start with Ed. Um, our speaker this morning, our, our morning keynote, talked about community engagements being ceaseless, and, um, and how important it is to this work, uh, to do things right, uh, design, planning. What, Ed, for the waterfront project, what would you like to see as it relates to inputs and community involvement and what at what points going forward should should we be looking for uh, weighing in right like certain milestones that kind sure of. so um, keep it on an and I apologize I guess I wasn't speaking loudly before can you hear me now mm -hmm. yeah you should hear me on a soccer field <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's it's always good to constantly direct your input, again, whether it's to the parks department, uh, Mike Strom, whether it's to council um, or your, your older people, it's always important. And if you're one of the stakeholder groups, there's a lot of stakeholder groups out there. Advocacy is really important, and I think Madison understands how effective and how powerful adv advocacy can be. Uh, so the master plan, again, look for it end of the year, beginning of the year. Every project that's identified will go through uh, a review and approval process. It's a shoreline. We've got funding. Both of those, and, it, and part of it will be partner public funding. Doesn't all have to come from our tax dollars. There's state and federal funding that can help finance this project, and there's private philanthropy. But all of the permitting and all of the public funding usually require some form of, of public meetings. So be diligent, look for it, it will be announced. Um, again, to share my success and my perspective on projects, uh, I look at public engagement not just as a, a political thing, as a feel-good thing. When you want projects to be successful, by having public engagement, you just are, are planting the seeds, you're creating an ownership a public ownership. And when we complain about maintenance and dollars and vandalism, the best way to not have to deal with that issue is to have ownership of a project from its conception through its, its loving it as it lives and, and, and uh, prospers. So my, my definition of public engagement is from the time you hear the idea to the time you sit on a bench and you say, who the heck put this paint on here? You own it and it starts with public engagement. Thank you. Uh, John, same question. What should we be on the lookout for as it relates to the campus, and when slash where should we look to get involved? 
Yeah, so uh, if you just uh, go to our website, we have a, at the top projects, and this is one of our projects. Uh, you can sign up there. Uh, if your organization uh, would like to be more engaged, we have a list of organizations we're sending out approximately monthly newsletters, uh, updates on the project as well. And I know some of those partner organizations are sending out uh, that information and their newsletters to their, their uh, followers as well. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities. If you're interested at all, go through one of those channels, stop at the booth, see us. Uh, we'd be happy to, we want as many people engaged as possible. Yeah, I, I was remiss too. The, if you go onto the city's website, both parks and uh, the ad hoc committee, there's a list of, of city committees. They have links to their meetings, the agendas, and things that were presented. So those of you that have access to uh, electronics, those are two really good ways to stay in touch. And the Sustained Dane team um, is all over this as well, and they'll help keep everybody who is in attendance today informed. So let's uh, join me in uh, thanking our, 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 our featured guests.